How many of you own a Polaroid camera at some point in your life? How many of you have never heard of one? They're actually making a comeback, you know. This is a big deal. Kids are getting Polaroid cameras now. Uh, when I was young, there were two types of Polaroid cameras. Uh, Polaroid cameras pretty much documented the use of my life. Um, but there were two types. There was the kind that just spit it right out, and you'd watch it kind of develop before your eyes. But actually, prior to that, my grandfather had a, had a newfangled Polaroid back in the day that you pulled it out, and it went, and then you peeled off part of it that did the developing on the picture. Anybody old enough remember that? Thank you. Uh, but a lot of my <laughs> youth was was developed in this. And l- l- let me show you a few pics. Here's a few Polaroid pics. <laughs> this is my sister and I in our above ground pool over at my grandparents' house in Flemingsburg, Kentucky. She loves me more probably than I deserve. And uh, this is a picture of my grandmother who made my German chocolate cake for my 15th birthday. And that's me and my grandmother and my mom's on our back porch, which that was our cistern, which we got our water out of. And uh, that was my junior prom. Wasn't I a handsome devil? No. (laughs) Okay, get rid of those, get rid of those, get rid of those. How many of you have taken a picture along the way and thought it captured the moment, only to realize as you went back and looked at the picture that it kind of, um, uh, it got photobombed? by someone, either intentional or unintentional, you know, you're on vacation at the beach, you take a picture of your kids, and later you discover there's a 300-pound guy in a Speedo in the background or something like that, and it kind of ruins the, kind of ruins the, the, the picture, but, you know, even with all that said, even though a lot of uh, pictures like that can kind of get ruined in that regard, I still like the candid shots much better than the staged ones, even though, you know, where they line you up and say, okay, everybody smile, and you know, you move over here, balance the picture. You know, that's great. But the candid shots kind of catch life as it's going. You know, and I think those are the most interesting uh, pictures of all rather than the perfect ones. So I want to ask you a question today with that in mind. How's your life going? How's your life going? Are you living the life that you pictured you'd be living? Maybe only a few years ago, what was the picture that you had for your life? For 2022, God willing, you'd make it there. Or maybe just a few months ago. Or maybe 20 years ago. I I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I have this tendency to fill photo albums in my head of how I think life is supposed to be the way that I want it to be for for me and for others. And I I sometimes am guilty of falling in love with that picture. I really want that, whatever that is. But the problem is, and you all know too well, life as we know it often gets interrupted by things that you never pictured being a part of your your story. And all of a sudden you find out the reality is it's never going to be the way that you pictured it. And sometimes it happens really, really fast. Now we all have this. We all have this one thing in our life where we kind of look up at God and we say, okay, I know life is going to be tough. I know there's going to be some difficulties I'm going to have to go through. God, you can touch any part of my life, but don't, please don't touch this part. This is the one thing. This, this is the one thing. I, I, I don't know if I can go on if this part of my life g- gets touched. Uh, if, if you could just guarantee, Lord, that this thing could never be, be touched or harmed in any way, please. What is that one thing for you? Is it, is it a name? Is it a family member? Is it, is it, a, is it a place? What, 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 what is that? What's the one thing, if you could make it immune from all of life's interruptions, what, what would it be? And here's the follow-up question to that. What do you do when that very thing is the thing that gets interrupted? How do you respond to that? And the short answer is, I know what the answer is to it, you deal with it. I mean, you either deal with it or you don't, right? I mean, that's all. That's really all, all we've got. You either give it all of your attention, you pour all your resources into it, you do the best you can, everything else gets put on hold, it becomes priority number one, because that's that one thing that's so important uh, to you. And we've all seen this, particularly over the last two years, I think. 
we, we've all seen the, the panic on people's faces and, and, and how we're in survivor mode a lot with, with what we've been through as a nation, as a world, and as a, as a community. You know, that there are storms in life. There, there, are, there are things that just interrupt. And, and you don't see them coming, and they disorient you for a while. And, and maybe through the encouragement of others, you, you say out loud, I think I can do this, I think I can get through this. But inside, you're falling apart. Inside, you, it cuts you to, to the core. And you feel shaky, right? However, the message of the gospel is that it's crucial, as I talked about last week from Psalm 119, and if you didn't get a chance to read it, back up and read it. In Psalm 119, it, it is very important. This is why it's so critical for us to have a, a solid foundation to stand on when things hit our lives. And it's so important to have the right one propping us up when we feel like we can't stand on our own anymore. And that's what Psalm 119 talks about. I, today I want to look briefly at a man by the name of Jeremiah uh, in the Old Testament. There's a whole book named after him. If you haven't read that for a while, you might want to back up and do so. I mean, it is raining. It's winter. This would be a great time to read the book of Jeremiah. He, he said it this way in Jeremiah 17. He said, this is what the Lord uh, says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart's heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in the salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in, in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Don't miss this. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Now, here in Kentucky, we usually, at least every other year, we have several weeks in which we get pretty, pretty good dry spell. We call it a drought. I'm not really sure it's classified as a drought, but we have maybe a few weeks where we don't have any rain and everything kind of browns up in the heat. But I can remember growing up in the back of our property, you could... You could look back, it was fairly flat for about 45, 50 acres, and you could look back and you could see the tree line that went along the creek bank because it was the only trees that remained green, the ones that went along the, the, the creek bank. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before because they're tapped into a source there that maybe the rest of it isn't a life-giving source, that, that water source that, that is providing life for them. And, and as a result, they have the strength to get through whatever dry spell may be coming their way. And that's kind of the picture that Jeremiah is painting for us here. So the question becomes for us is, is this, where are you planted? Where are you planted? See, that's, that's an important question. What are you leaning on? What are you trusting in to preserve your life under the worst of conditions? Because even though you don't expect them, they're going to come from time to time. You know, Jesus uh, used and talked about this over and over using different metaphors, right? I've mentioned this several times. In Matthew 7, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon a solid foundation so that when the rain comes down and the winds blow and that storm you didn't expect arises in your life, you're going to be able to, to withstand it because you're built on something solid. Don't, don't ever forget that. And you will not fall because of the choice that you made to build your life on something that's solid. So again, what are you building your life on? You know, I know a lot of you, not all of you very well, but many of your stories. And uh, <clears throat> I know this, I know that a lot of you, because I know your story, I, I know a lot of you would have crumbled had you not had your life built on something solid. I know a lot of you wouldn't be able to be here today had you not had your life built on something solid because of the things that you've encountered and gone through in your life because the storm hit you really, really, really hard. Now, here's the other aspect of that. Sometimes when the storm hits, they're brief. They don't last very long. 
But sometimes there's a storm that hits your life that uh, it's not brief. And it interrupts you from this moment on. In other words, life is never going to be the same. It's going to be changed because of what has happened. And you never pictured it to be that way. Right? You never conjured it up in the photo album of your mind to end like this or to end up like this at all. This guy, Jeremiah, was dealing with exactly the same question. Jeremiah was um, an interesting guy. He was called by God at a young age to be a prophet, a spokesperson for God, a messenger, if you will, to, the, to, the, to his people. And, uh, you know, when I, and, and I was thinking about what Gabrielle was saying when she was talking about her calling, and I was reflecting back on my teen years when I felt that same calling and on my life, and I've had conversations with the staff and John about this kind of thing. You know, when you first get that, uh, it really sounds um, good, and it is. It, it's a, there's not, not a higher calling you can have, I don't think, than when God speaks to you in some form or fashion and says, you know, kind of taps you on the shoulder and says, I got something good in store for you. But the good that we think it's going to be is different from the way good that God thinks it's going to be sometimes. And I don't, you know, I, I'm sure it sounded good to Jeremiah, but if you read his story, it didn't turn out any way like he pictured it. And, and maybe you're sitting here today and you feel the same way. I, I mean, you read those first verses of Jeremiah about God having a purpose and a plan in our lives. And we buy into that and how God puts us together in our mother's womb. And yet, the problem is you can't close your Bible there and stop reading. Because afterwards, what he does is he tells Jeremiah that he has a plan and a purpose for him. But that plan and purpose isn't anything what he pictured that plan and purpose really to be. And it certainly wasn't fun. It wasn't going to be an enjoyable life. See, the plan and purpose that God was giving Jeremiah was to deliver a very, very hard and difficult message to God's people in Judah. And what he was getting ready to tell them was that, touch anything in my life but this kind of an announcement. You know, if I can make anything immune, make this immune. And, and what the message was is that he was going to go tell the nation. And not only the nation, but their prized city, Jerusalem, was soon going to fall. And they, as a result, were going to be exiled and ran out of their home that they had been in for many, many years. And, and they were going to be uprooted and planted somewhere else. And everything they knew about life was going to come to a screeching halt. Now, no one likes to give a message like that that nobody wants to hear. And very rarely do people even listen to a message like that when you give it. You know what I mean? Jeremiah 119 says, this was part of the message, here's what I want you to understand, he said. He said, these people that are going to come in on you are going to fight you, but they will not overcome you, for I am going to be with you, and I will rescue you, says the Lord, or declares the Lord. So even though this is going to happen, and I'm warning you in advance, Jeremiah says, but you need to keep in mind something. They're not going to overcome you. I'm going to be here, and I'm going, I'm going to rescue you. So there's a promise here. It's, life's going to get really, really tough. Your enemy is coming. It's going to slam into your life, but you're not going to be overcome and crushed because you're mine. Now, I want you to understand these are the same promises that God makes over and over all through the entire Bible. You, you need to be reminded of this. We, we read last week John 16, 33. In this world, you, you're going to have trouble, but be of good cheer because Christ says, I've overcome uh, the world. So in a nutshell, the message really all the way through from the Old Testament into the very end, it's always been the same. Life is going to be hard. Life's, your life's going to get interrupted from time to time. But God's going to take care of you. God's going to take care of you. And the rest of Jeremiah's life, if you read about it, was certainly no picnic. It was a tough life. I mean, he was made fun of constantly. He was put in jail. He was placed in stocks. And for just to save you the picture in your mind, he was thrown into basically a latrine for an extended period of time when he was in prison and then exiled to Egypt. And all through his ministry, do you know how many people actually bought in or listened? None other than the 
a couple that were the very closest to him. That was it. And in the, in the middle of that, you know Jeremiah had to question, why am I doing this? Have you ever had that day where you woke up and you go, why, why am I doing this? What is this all uh, about? And I don't know about you, but I know the story of Jeremiah, and I know my story. He became so depressed, he actually became, I guess in some form or fashion, a little bit suicidal. Like he didn't really want to live anymore. I'm telling you that because I want to remind you of something that's very important I think we tend to forget. And this is part of my job, to come in and remind you of things. Some things you already know, some things you maybe are learning for the first time. But I want to remind you that the people of the scripture were just like us. They were human beings. They had emotions, and they had questions, and they had doubts, and they had fears. And if you want to learn about proper response, then you need to read about the lives of these individuals so you can feel encouraged by that. Jeremiah chapter 12, he writes this. He said, you are always righteous, Lord. Listen to his complaint. You are always righteous, Lord, when I bring the case before you, yet I have a complaint. <laughs> I would speak to you about your justice. And here's what I'm asking. Why does it that the way of the wicked seem to prosper? Why do all the faithless people seem to be living at ease? You have planted them. They have taken root. That isn't how I thought it was supposed to be. They grow up and they bear fruit. You are always on their lips. They talk about you, but they're, you're far from their hearts. Have you ever thought something similar to that? When you evaluate what life's really all about and the people around you? Why is it that evil people are doing good and God-fearing people seem to be not doing as good as the evil people? It's that old thing about why do bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people and God it just doesn't add up and I can't keep the score and it doesn't make any sense and therefore why am I doing what I'm doing? Right? There's some desperation in Jeremiah's voice. And the desperation is kind of coming through with this thought. I'm doing what you asked me to do, God. I've been following you and given your message and so what what's the deal why, why is it working out like this I don't quite understand it as a matter of fact he gets so low as I've already alluded to in Jeremiah 20 he wrote this cursed be the day that I was born wish I'd never been born I, re I really don't want to live in this world like this may the day my mother bore me not be blessed you ever feel like that you want to praise God, you want to, but at the end of the day, you just don't get it. You don't, it doesn't make sense to you, you know, and, and you realize that your life is never going to be what you pictured it to be. The next book of the Bible, oh, it's even getting better, came to be encouraged, is the book of Lamentations. Lamentations. It is the kind of book just like its name. Um. <laughs> it means songs of pain. <laughs> there you go. Songs of pain. It, if you read this book, it's like a bad country song. Very depressing. And, and really what it's about, it's written from the perspective of someone kind of walking through the heap of rubble in Jerusalem uh, after, you know, enemy comes in and, and they're weeping or as they go through. Uh, the city, kind of like people did at Mayfield a couple of weeks ago. And most likely, most scholars agree, Jeremiah is singing or the blues here a little bit. I mean, literally singing the blues, uh, like these, these songs about this. And so Lamentations 3 offers us this lament. I remember my affliction and my wondering. I remember the bitterness and the gall that I felt inside. I will, I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Now that sounds pretty discouraging, but don't miss this part. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore this is why I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They're new every single day, every morning. Great, here's the words of the old song, great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, 
Therefore, you know what I'm going to choose to do? I'm going to choose to wait on him because he's going to work it out. That may be one of the most difficult concepts you face in your Christian journey. But it's true. He's saying, listen, sometimes when life gets interrupted, all I can hope for is just enough of you, Lord, to be able to get through the day. Right? I want to ask you, what do you do with your life when it looks different from what you pictured it to be? When something came in and harshly, abruptly interrupted it in a way that you never imagined that it would. Jeremiah says, here's what I did, and this is what I want to encourage you to do. You bring that pain to God, and then you remind yourself of what he promised you about life. What is that? You're not going to be consumed. You're not going to be destroyed. You're going to have enough to be able to get through whatever it is that you're you're facing. You have enough if you will plant yourself beside the water like the tree and if you build your life on the on the rock because great is his faithfulness. You can count on that. And when we come to a place like this and I think that's kind of what motivates us together here, we read that in other verses, for instance like Romans chapter 8 verse 31 where Paul would write What should we say in response to all these things that go on in life? He said, here's the question we need to ask ourselves. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can really be against us? He's saying, listen, there's someone stronger than any weight that is pushing against you, and he's going to keep you from getting crushed, even though you feel like you, you are when your life gets interrupted. When you find out that you your chi- you got a child or a grandchild that's going to be born with a severe health issue or deformity. When they come back and tell you that the test results say, yes, it is cancer. When they call you into the room and consult with you, we have to put them on a ventilator. When the EMT looks back up at you and says, I'm sorry, they're gone. We've done all we can do. When you discover, after a lot of suspicion, that somebody you've spent your life with has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Or the papers are served. What are you going to do? And I'm not trying to be negative. I'm trying to be realistic. What are you going to do? I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to do one of two things, the same thing, two things that people have done all along. I said this last week. Let me remind you. You're going to follow God or you're going to fall apart. There's just not much in between. What will you do? Peter wrote about this. 1 Peter 1. In all this you greatly rejoice. There is some good stuff. Though now for a little while you may have to suffer some grief of all kinds of trials, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though it's refined by fire, even gold doesn't last forever, may result in praise and glory and honor when Christ returns and he's revealed in you now and later. All of that to say this, life rarely turns out as we picture it, but there are some guarantees. One of them we don't like, life is tough, it's hard, but the other promise is, and this is why I came today, this is what got me out of bed, because I didn't want to get out of bed today. You ever have those days? I didn't want to get out of bed today. I told Courtney before the first service. She said, how are you? And I said, God, make me a bird so I can fly far, far away. Forrest Gump. There's hope. And the hope is, is that God is for you. God is for you. He's there when you can't see him. He's protecting you when you can't feel him. 
or recognize it. He's paying attention when you think that he's ignoring you. He loves you. When what you love most, that thing that you hope would never be touched, is now gone. Listen to Romans chapter 8. Paul writes, he, God, who did not spare his own son, didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also now interceding for you and for me. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who? What? He goes, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, we face death all day long. We're like sheep to, the, to be slaughtered. Listen, God did not spare his son. Why? Why did he not do that? Why did he allow Christ to go through? So that you and I could stand before him with all of our failures and with all of our messes that we've had in, in life and be declared holy and, and righteous just as his son who is at the right hand of the father today. Paul who wrote those words knew all too well himself exactly what that meant. I mean, read the life of Paul. John been teaching on it on Wednesday night. Come and read and learn about the, the life of, of Paul. If there's anything that bad could happen to a person, he had it happen. I mean, literally. I mean, you can't hardly name anything. And when his life was interrupted time and time and time again, he would write things like Romans 8.37 that says this, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We're going to overcome it. It may not be pictured the way that we thought it was going to be, but we're going to be overcomers. Now, pun intended, I don't know how life is developing for you right now, what the picture is going to look like, and I don't know how it's going to turn out. I know it's going to be hard. I can guarantee that, and I know it's going to be interrupted from time to time. But here's what I'm here to tell you today. There's someone stronger and wiser and bigger and more powerful than anything that you're going to go through in your life. And I want to explain something to you before I quit this message, and I want you to please hear me on this. You know, I, I've been pretty much all over the world, and that's not a brag. I, I just It's a fact. And I've seen a lot of incredible things. I've seen some really bad things. I've seen some really uh, beautiful, the most beautiful things the, our world has to, to offer. Um, but as I have looked around, and as I look around daily, I, and I want you to think about your life for a moment. I want to think about your work. I want to think about what you do. You may enjoy it, a great deal of it. Um, but I, I just want you to understand, and I hope that's the case, but if this is all there is, if what we're doing every day is the best that there is, I think you're going to wake up one day and have trouble finding motivation to do it. I think you're going to have trouble putting that in a proper perspective of understanding what it really is if you think this is all there is. And quite frankly, as I said before, for some of you who have gone through some of the storms that, that, that you've gone through, I, I'm just telling you if, you, if you think this is all there is, when some of these interruptions come in your life, they're going to wipe you out. They're going to cut your feet out from underneath of you, and they are going to destroy you. I'm here to tell you today, this isn't all there is. And I'm very grateful for, for that. God is after much more, something much more significant than the few years we have on this side of heaven. First, Second Corinthians chapter 4, listen to what Paul wrote. We are hard-pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed. You ever feel perplexed by what's going on around you, like you just don't understand it? Doesn't make sense? We are perplexed, but we're not in despair. Persecuted, but we're not alone. We're not abandoned. Struck down. You, you've heard the definition of success, right? It's the ability to get up after you've been knocked down. We, we are not struck down, but not destroyed. 
So what's his conclusion? Therefore, we do not lose heart. Outwardly, yes, we're wasting away. We all know that. Inwardly, however, we're being renewed day by day because our light and momentary troubles are achieving something for us beyond all this. An eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So what do you got to do? How do you get through it? How do you handle when life gets interrupted? Here it is. You fix your eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, because what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. That's how you do it. Because of what Jesus did, you and I have life. And if we believe in him and follow him, what this is teaching us is that you and I can actually look beyond all the interruptions and any trouble that we come up against that comes our way, and we can actually have the audacity, the boldness to call it what Paul called it. It's small and temporal in comparison to what you have in store for me. And I'm going to be able to endure whatever this is because I know what that is going to be. It's more and greater than anything I can ever imagine. Or picture. That's the miracle of the gospel. God took all that could crush us and he put it on his son. Everything that was good and holy about his son. And he dressed you and me in that. Check this out please. And he said as often as you get together you need to remember something. And here's what this is about today. When you take this little piece of bread in your hand today, he said, I want you to remember something. I want you to remember just how for you I really am. That's what this does. You need to take a piece of bread. You need to break it. You need to remember that my body was broken and that I am for you. I don't care what whispers in your ear that I'm not. I am for you. I don't care what interrupts your life and you think that I've abandoned you. I am for you. Don't ever forget that. And you need to take this juice and you need to drink it and remember my blood that was poured out for you. Because God is saying to you and me today, I don't want any of you to think that I am not for you. I have always been for you. I was for you then. I'm going to be for you in the future and I'm, I'm for you right now. And that's why we gather together. Now listen, I'm going to pray in just a moment. We're going to sing a song. If you have a, something on your heart and mind, you want to come up and pray, or you just want to chat a little bit, or we can help you any way we can, or if you want to say, today's my day of commitment to Christ, I want to be buried in Christian baptism, I want to renew my commitment at the beginning of a new year, then this will be a great moment to do that. Let's pray about it. Father, we pause for a second just to, wow, thank you for your word and the things that we need to be reminded of that we have a tendency to put aside and get sidetracked from so easily and when we get caught up in the interruptions of, of life. And we certainly would love to say, please don't interrupt me anymore, but we know that that's not very realistic. And that God, that sometimes uh, that one thing that we never pictured we pictured some rough things ahead but we never pictured it without them or in this way or alone or with this health condition or with this struggle financially so God whatever it is I don't know my friends are going through here today I pray that we will not ever leave this place without being mindful. This is not all there is. There's something greater. And I thank you for that hope, and I pray this. For all my friends here and the many that are not, as we anticipate and picture the future, that we picture it by imagining what it is that you ultimately have in store for us, no matter what comes our way here. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name.